So making this uh, refractory material is, I said, is made out of ingredients that you can get at a uh, hardware store. And one of the first ingredients on this is this triple super phosphate. And so that's a fairly easy thing to get a hold of. The other two things are the slaked lime as well as the perlite. And another more common term for slaked lime is hydrated lime. So the key thing is that this is calcium hydroxide. And then the last part of this is the perlite. So the triple phosphate and the uh, hydrated lime are going to react with each other to form calcium phosphate. The role that the perlite serves is to just increase the insulation value of the material that you end up with. So you don't technically have to use this, but if you don't, you're going to end up with something that's not going to be as uh, thermally insulating. Um, and just as a point here, you want to use the perlite, not vermiculite, because the perlite is going to one, have a higher temperature, I believe, that it will uh, start to fuse at. And I believe the other part is it doesn't absorb water as well. This is meant more for aeration, and the vermiculite is actually, if I'm not mistaken, is made to be able to absorb <clears throat> the water and be able to use that for, uh, basically, to allow the soil to contain more water, as well as probably uh, aerate it as well. And, you know, Water and high temperatures are not necessarily good friends, if you know that. The triple phosphate comes in this uh, granular form because, well, since it's designed as a fertilizer, it's meant to be slow release. And, you know, you obviously don't want to get too much phosphate into the material or into the soil that fast. But obviously this doesn't work very well for us. Um, Turns out that the easiest way to render this into a finer powder, aside from probably finding some place where I could just buy it that way, uh, is to use a coffee grinder. And I went through this thought that, oh, I'm going to need to use a burr grinder because the stuff is so hard and all that. But it turns out, no. Um, just your standard cheapo uh, coffee grinder does perfectly fine on getting this into a powder form, which is what we have right here. So this is the triple phosphate and I ran it through the uh, coffee grinder and then just used a fine mesh to sieve it. Uh, and then next to that is the perlite and that I ran through a food processor. Um, pro tip, do not use your spouse's favorite food processor for this uh, and rendered into a fine powder. I'll get back to why that's not really a big issue. I uh, I had a little bit of a hang up on that at first thinking that this was going to really be an issue because the point of the perlite is that it has this uh, porosity to it. But I'll get back to that. Uh, and then this is just the uh, slaked lime here. So that one basically comes as a powder so it doesn't need any special treatment. So the mixture here is actually pretty straightforward. If you work out the stoichiometry on this, um, let me just go ahead and zero out that. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I can put this up. Uh, it's 3.7, uh, it's a mass per mass ratio. So 3.7 of the triple phosphate to one part of the uh, lime and that's going to be your stoichiometric ratio that's going to get everything reacted. Uh, so in this case here, the most straightforward thing to do then would be to put in, well, we try to go for 3.7, but I'm gonna go for 37. enough uh, and then I'm going to put in 10 grams of the lime so bring that up to 47 and <clears throat> not a bad idea to wear some kind of uh, 
respirator while you're doing this, you know, like N95 mask or something. I particularly think getting the lime in your lungs would not be a particularly pleasant experience. Uh, though, it's worth pointing out, it's already been reacted with water, so it's not really going to have any problem with that. Um, <clears throat> but it is going to be absorbing carbon dioxide from the air, so that's one thing that you want to be careful about if you let this sit over time. Okay, so turn that off. And then what we do is we just mix this together. And now the triple phosphate does not get into as fine of a powder as I might wish. I suppose if I really wanted to get at this, I would find some other way to do it. Um, but it works well enough on this. And the other thing to keep in mind is that this stuff is not really terribly water soluble. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to completely submerge it under water. And we're going to allow it to basically diffuse together. And in the process, it's going to then react. And it's going to basically, the <clears throat> triple phosphate is a calcium uh, bi, you know, calcium, that's not biphosphate. I'm trying to think of what the right term is for this. There's a hydrogen in there. So it's calcium, hydrogen, the phosphate ion. Uh, and then the lime is, as I mentioned, is calcium hydroxide. So that's calcium and two hydroxides. That's the reason why you have the uh, ratio as it is, along with the fact that there, the phosphate adds more mass to this. Um, but when you, uh, when those react, the hydrogen and the triple phosphate will react with the hydroxide and produce water. And the calcium phosphate that results from this is water insoluble. So it can just basically sit right in the water. Um, okay, now this is the mix for the base. And what I've been doing, and it works reasonably well, is to take an equal volume of the uh, <clears throat> perlite here. But let me uh, make a quick mention about this. So, you know, the perlite, when you normally get it, it's in this again, kind of puffy granular form. It's literally a uh, mineral that is kind of almost popped like popcorn. Uh, and so it becomes very, you know, low density, uh, lots of porosity in it. And so you would figure that grinding it up into small pieces is not going to be, it sounds almost like you're going to get rid of the porosity. You know, a little bit like if you went around and crunched styrofoam uh, down. But the reality is that's not what's happening because when it breaks up, it becomes smaller particles, but it doesn't change the porosity. The stuff is brittle when you get down to it. So you're not going to crush it. You're going to break it. And when it's in such a fine form like this, if we were to zoom in on it, there would still be lots of porosity in this. So it's still a very kind of fluffy material. And so even mixing it in with this doesn't actually affect it that much. And I think that's actually a big deal because if you don't grind this up, then what's happening really is you're counting on this calcium phosphate that you'll get from this mix to kind of act like a matrix that's going to just sort of mechanically lock it into place. Arguably the same thing is happening when you do it with this as well. Um, but I think the difference though is that because it's a much finer grain size now, it really becomes more homogenous. And I think that's really where one of the keys to this is. It's going to be more heterogeneous if you use something that's much bigger. And I suspect it's going to give you issues with variability, among other things, in terms of the properties. Um, just doesn't seem like it's worth it to do it. But it took a lot of thinking on my end to really come to terms with this. So since this is pretty much about equal volumes here, roughly, I'm just going to add this into here. And then we proceed again to mix this all together. So it does become very important that this all get mixed thoroughly. And so I will say already that from my own experience, these powders 
you don't mix super great like this, so you might want to have some other way of agitating it. Um, but if you do, try not to produce dust because I don't think any of these things are going to be particularly nice to get in your lungs. Uh, or do something like that, for example. So, okay. So I think that's mixed up well enough. <clears throat> and then basically what's going to happen after this is you're going to put it into a mold. Um, it seems like the material possibly expands a little bit and you need to give a little compression on this for this to work correctly. So in the end, you know, you want to have it pressed into something that is going to basically be like in this case here, a brick. Um, that, by the way, is not any kind of symbol other than the fact that the uh, plastic tray I'm using happens to have this uh, kind of fancy recycling thing on it. Um, <clears throat> I can show you what happens if you don't compress it. If you don't, it will still form, but it's going to be crumbly as anything. I mean, actually, this is, yeah, I mean, it just, and if you really don't put any compression on it at all, it's just going to come out as some powder. Um, so this is basically what you're going to get if you don't put a little bit of compression on it. So that is a key thing that needs to be done. Uh, that's not a common thing. So this is one thing that differentiates it from some of the other cements and unfortunately does mean it's not necessarily going to be good for uh, refractory coating that you might be able to put on a material, but it makes some pretty good bricks. Just right so that you can have another block to sit on top of that. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, I've found that having something that the sides can break away works better. I was originally doing tests with things that had more of a square profile uh, or cylindrical. I was even using like, you know, pieces of PVC like this. Uh, but the problem that happens is it tends to, as I said, to expand and stick. So getting it out afterwards is difficult and that can cause some issues with the delamination. The other thing that I have found is that it really is essential to have it under pressure with at least some weight on top of it while you are getting it wet. Now the reason for that is because there are going to be air bubbles in the material and those air bubbles are going to start basically as soon as the water comes into contact. It's an exothermic reaction and it does actually work pretty quickly in terms of uh, starting to form the calcium phosphate. And so the air bubbles that can get formed as the water levels rising up through this material can start to cause some delamination. So, you know, as an example of that, you know, you can get things like this where if you look, it can get these kind of cracks along here. Um, this was when I was trying to actually press it down first and then just take the pressure off of it and then get it wet. Um, it, I mean, it works okay, but it's not great. I'm getting a lot better results with these bricks here. And, you know, then yeah, there's another example of this here, you can see. So this is a very common problem. If you don't have consistent pressure on there, you're going to end up with these kind of horizontal... Uh, laminations like this and that's obviously not terribly good so <clears throat> what you can do is use this so i got my mix here and basically just put it in if you can probably see the uh that little symbol there that's the thing that gets reproduced it's impressive that this actually does do a decent job of reproducing the uh, surface features and so whether that's useful for something, I have no idea. Um, but if there were ever a need to do some kind of texturing or something, then it would be possible to do it. Um, still, like I said, really no idea what you would gain from doing that, but that's something that maybe with more experimentation I can find out. All right, and so now, Instead of putting this directly on, because it does have some adhesion to it, um, I just use a small piece of uh, cloth or 
in this case this is like one of these uh, garage wipe kind of things that cloth like but it's also paper and just put this into here and press it down and then what I do is I just put a weight on top of it happens that a good old piece of brick like that works just fine and then you just add water to this and so it doesn't actually have to be fully immersed even this is enough water as it is and so what will happen is that will just sort of seep up and I kind of feel like it's better to let this go somewhat slowly so I have a tendency to just let this sit overnight. Once it's been solidified, it's not going to do anything. It's water insoluble at that point. Um, then I take it out afterwards and then I dry it. Um, I've taken to actually just putting this in the oven at like 500 degrees Fahrenheit for half hour to dry it off. Don't tell my wife I do that. Um, and then end up with things like this. And so that's basically what you're going to end up getting. This is a nice thicker one. I haven't actually tested this in terms of its, uh, I haven't put it up to heat yet, uh, but that's something that we'll try. And actually this is, this here is the brick that I demonstrated in that other video. It's quite lightweight now. Uh, you can see that there's clearly some vitrification going on on there. So but it seems to hold up pretty well, even under repeated uh, exposures to high temperatures. So, hopefully this will, uh, will be useful to somebody. Um, I'm working towards making larger pieces. I think what I'm going to eventually be trying to do is to actually just make a hearth as one solid piece, because I have a feeling that that's going to be the better way to do this. Otherwise, I might think about trying to make a couple of bricks and then find a way to join them together to uh, to make the chamber for the furnace. But uh, this will be some more experimentation. It's going to take a little while with the small coffee grinder I picked up to uh, make enough of the uh, triple phosphate powder. Unless I actually start taking a look around and seeing where I can buy that uh, compound in a powdered form already, not as a fertilizer. Oh, thank you very much for your attention on this, and uh, hopefully it will be useful to somebody, like I said.